I've been preaching and teaching, and I said, along the theme of seeking God. And last week, we kind of catapulted out of Isaiah chapter 58. And one of the benefits that is mentioned of fasting is revelation. Is revelation from God. And so as a result of that, I ended up going to Matthew chapter 16. And in that passage where the Father reveals to Peter who Jesus is. And now today, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, which tells us a whole lot about revelation from God. And there's a short little passage here, and it's one of the key passages, probably, in understanding revelation. And the goal, I guess, is to help us understand when we're talking about seeking God, what we're kind of looking for, what we're anticipating. Um, when I talk about seeking God, when I say I'm seeking God about something, I'm, I'm looking to hear from God. I guess it's a better way of saying it. We refer to that as seeking God. God's not lost. Uh, we don't have to go find him. We're not playing hide and go seek, so to speak. But a lot of times when we use that phrase, what we're saying is I need to hear from God. I'm in battle. I'm in a situation here. God needs to tell me what to do. Uh, God needs to give me some instruction. God needs to give me some direction here. God needs to give me some guidance. I need to seek God. I need to hear from God. And as I've been sharing, you know, when we come up against a battle, we come up against an obstacle in life, the, the very first response of all believers should be, I need to see God. That should be automatic. That should be automatic. I need to see God. I need to call out upon God. I need to know what God's word says about this situation. I need to hear from God. And that should be our number one thing, always, in any situation. We should always be looking to, what does God say about this situation? What does God have? What's God's input here? And so we're learning it in a great degree, not only how to do that on our own, but we're also looking to goal here, how to see God move out there. And uh, in, in, in the highways and the byways, as the Bible says, in the hedges and in the bushes and all of that, how do we see the move of God out there? And one of the things I'm going to be teaching a little bit upon touching upon with this morning is, is to understand why we need to see a move of God out there. And, and how absolutely helpless mankind is without a move of God. And uh, so 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 16. I'm going to go ahead and read some of those verses. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. But we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the word which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Now if you go back to verse 7, what we're really going to focus on this morning, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now, in verse 7, in a mystery, is where I want to focus on and teach upon this morning, is primarily what's the Bible talking about when it says a mystery. You know, again, this is one of those things that we do as Christians. We read through the Bible, we read right over verses like that, and we never stop thinking, like, okay, what's he talking about in a mystery? You know, in, in most of our context in our culture we think of a mystery probably most people here automatically think of a tv show 
I mean, you think of some kind of detective show, some kind of mystery on TV, you know, whatever it might be, uh, some kind of police show, you know, TV's covered, and, you know, just, you know, got all kinds of mysteries on them. And most people, when I say in a mystery, are probably going to think of a television show. Or maybe you're going to think of a book you read, a, a mystery book at some point in life, but most of us are probably going to think of a, a detective story. Uh, that's not what it's talking about there. It is no way, shape, or form talking about a mystery in the sense of what we've grown accustomed to a mystery being. It's not talking about a detective show. It's not talking about a novel there. It's not talking about anything even remotely close to that. Uh, a mystery in the Bible, let me read you a definition. That would be outside the range of unassisted natural apprehension. In other words, it's something that you can't figure out. It's something that humanity cannot know of their own abilities and their own, and their own understanding. Can be made known only by divine revelation. And is made known only by divine revelation. And is made known in a manner and in a time appointed by God and to those only who are illuminated by his spirit. In the ordinary sense of mystery implied knowledge withheld, in a scriptural sense, it is truth revealed. In other words, when the Bible talks about a mystery, to understand it is talking about something that only you and I can know if God reveals it to us. It's not something that I can understand with my intellectual abilities. It's not something I can understand through my personal experience. It's not something you can go into a laboratory and get out your test tubes and, and figure out. It's, some, it's a knowledge that mankind has no access to unless God reveals it to him. Uh, you know, I always think of, when I think of the, the Greek word here, I've always thought of, you know, when uh, you, you see when they have a, an artist finish a, a painting and they have the unveiling of that painting. You know, you have a room full of people and here's the painting, it's covered with a veil. In other words, there's no way for anybody out there to know what the painting's about. You can't sit there and, and look at that covered painting and, and, and say, well, I bet it's about this, or I bet it's this. The only way you can know what that painting is is when they take the veil off. It's when they unveil it. Then you have revelation or understanding of what that is. And, and that's a, a better understanding of this. It's not a mystery novel. But it's talking about things that only you and I can know if God reveals it to us. You see, beloved, just like, if you remember last week, we, in Matthew chapter 16, how, how did, how did uh, Peter know that Jesus was the Messiah? What did Jesus say? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who art in heaven. The only way he knew that was because the Father had revealed it to him. Peter didn't figure it out. Peter didn't understand it. Peter, Peter didn't find out from his neighbor. He didn't find out from the newspaper. He didn't find out from the news media. He didn't find out any other way other than the fact that God revealed it to him. That Jesus was the Messiah. So when it's talking about a mystery here, it's talking about something that you and I can only know if God reveals it to us. And then it went on to say that it's only for those who have illumination of the Holy Spirit. You see, without the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, we can't understand the things of God. You remember in uh, John chapter 3 when, when Nicodemus came to Jesus? And, and, you know, they well, you know, we know you're from God because we see these great miracles you do and, and we see these powerful things you're doing. And, and Jesus just kind of interrupted him and said, you know, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. And a lot of people kind of misinterpret that. They, mis, they misquote that scripture all the time. They say you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. It doesn't say that. It says you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. And that word see there just means that, to have understanding of the kingdom of God. To have a revelation of the kingdom of God. To have knowledge of the kingdom of God. And if you'll notice that Nicodemus went on saying, well, how can these things be? How can that be that I can be born again? I mean, can, can you enter back into your mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus went on to describe more things to him that, you know, you, know, you can't see the wind, but that's how the Spirit comes and you're born again. And Nicodemus' response again was, how can these things be? And Jesus says, well, you know, uh, you know you, you're, a, you're a teacher of Israel, and you don't understand this most basic thing. And he went on to tell him and said, you know, if you don't understand earthly things, how in the world are you going to understand heaven? <coughs> you see, Nicodemus had no understanding of it at that time, because at that time, the Holy Spirit didn't live within Nicodemus. He could not understand it. He was a religious man, going through all the religious duty, all the religious exercises, but he had no understanding of the things of 
God. Because he did not have any revelation. The kingdom of God to him was a mystery, and he was trying to figure it out, and that's why he came to Jesus. You know, Jesus, I, I don't know what's going on here. I don't understand this, but I know you're a God. And it seems like his answer that Jesus told him was a little odd, and he was saying, you know what? I can't explain these things to you until you're born again. You see, we can't understand the things of God until we're born again. We always, I always tell people, you know, people go witness to somebody, some worldly person, and, and share something with them and come back to this offer and say, they just don't get it. I say, well, you're right, they don't. And they're not going to. Unless it's revealed to them by the Spirit of God, it's a mystery. There are many things in the Word of God that we can't have understanding of. Unless the Spirit of God reveals it to us. You know, and, and, and just like in Matthew chapter 16, and, and I shared that with, you know, when Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? The men who had devised all these theories about who Jesus was had no revelation. They had no understanding. Who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. They were all dead. So apparently in their minds, they're trying to figure out who Jesus is because they see him doing all these miracles. They think he must be somebody of God. Apparently one of the prophets has been resurrected. In other words, with their natural mind, without the revelation of God, they had no understanding about who Jesus Christ was. The Bible tells us that those who, are, who, are, who do not have revelation from the, the Spirit of God, that the, the preaching of the cross to them is just foolishness. In other words, you can tell them all you want that Jesus died for, but the Holy Spirit has to reveal that to them. And that's where this is very important for us to grasp, beloved, where unless the Holy Spirit reveals Christ and crucified to a lost individual, they will never understand it. We can explain it, we can talk to them, we can argue with them, we can debate it with them, we can do get all kinds of intellectual proofs we want, but unless the Holy Spirit brings revelation, the kingdom of God is a mystery. And that's important to understand. Because when I'm talking about us seeking God, and when I'm talking about how much there's a great need out there for the move of the Holy Spirit, beloved, I'll share this with you. Without a move of the Holy Spirit, every lost person out there is going to perish. Without the Spirit of God revealing Christ to them, every lost person is going to perish. They have to have the revelation of the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus Christ to them. And one of the first things that the Word of God does is it convinces the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment. And without a move of the Holy Spirit, convincing them of sin, of righteousness, and judgment, they will perish. Period. It's a mystery to them. Maybe so far in the house of spirit. You see, we've got to understand that the, and what we're looking at today in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 it, it, is get an understanding of some of the works of the Holy Spirit. And, and one of the, the elements of the Holy Spirit I just shared with you was, is to bring the world to Jesus. And the way that happens is, is, is through the convincing, persuading of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, of revealing to the world who Christ is. To a blind individual who's blind to the kingdom of God. And then we know that the Holy Spirit, then when we, we place our faith in Christ, and then the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us and comes to dwell within us. And, you know, people always try to describe, uh, you know, quite often, you know, what's a Christian? Who's a Christian? Well, a Christian is somebody who goes to church. And if you notice, they all, so often focus on behavior. A Christian is not defined by their behavior. A Christian is somebody who, who put their faith in Christ and him crucified, and the Holy Spirit lives within them. A Christian is somebody who the Spirit of God dwells within them. And the book of Romans tells us very plainly, if the Spirit of God don't dwell within us, then we don't belong to Christ. If we're born again, the Spirit of God dwells within us. At that point in time, we are in a place where we can begin to gain understanding about the things of God. At that point in time, we're in a place where we can begin to see and get revelation about the kingdom of God. We know then that there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's what uh, Jesus taught about it. The day of Pentecost, you receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And, and we see it in Acts chapter 8 when Philip went into Samaria. One of the first things he done was brought down Peter and John to pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10, when they went and preached to the Gentiles, God poured out his Spirit, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19, when Paul went into Ephesus, the first thing he did was, have you received the Holy Spirit? And we see that pattern throughout the Bible. They received the fullness of baptism. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, they 
they spoke in tongues, and, and, and that's throughout the book of Acts. The book of Acts is, is very much centered around that point and around that experience. So we know that we can be born again and we receive the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. We also know that we can be baptized in the Holy Spirit to empower us to do God's work. But there's also an aspect of it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that so often people don't understand. One of the number one ways that the Holy Spirit is described in the Bible is as a teacher, as an instructor, and as a guide. So we know we can be born again, we know we can be baptized in the Holy Spirit, but let us look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 again. Look at verses 9 and 10. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. In other words, you're not going to see, you figure it out with your eyes, you're not going to do it with your ears, you're not going to do it unless revelation from the Holy Spirit comes. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. So one of the first things we understand about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit comes to bring revelation to us. But what does he come to reveal to us? Look at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So the Holy Spirit comes to regenerate us, the Holy Spirit comes to empower us, but the Holy Spirit also comes to reveal to us the things that have been freely given to us of God. The, one of the assignments, so to speak, if you want to look at that way, of the Holy Spirit in our life is to reveal to you and I the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus. You see, there's a connection because if you remember, I go back to when we was in Isaiah chapter 58, one of the benefits of fasting being revelation, and that's what we're talking about, right in the same verse after revelation comes healing. Why? Because that's how we receive anything from God. He reveals it to us, and we believe it. And that's how it comes. And without the Holy Spirit being our teacher, without the Holy Spirit being our leader, without the Holy Spirit being our guide, without the Holy Spirit bringing us revelation, beloved, then we cannot see into the things of the kingdom of God. It's simply a mystery to us. I can't figure it out with my brain. I can't figure it out by my experience. I can't figure it out by talking to my neighbors. I can't figure it out by watching television. I have to hear from God. You have to hear from God. You have to be Holy Spirit taught. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Or else the enemy has become religious destruction. So go to Romans chapter 16. So, okay, Pastor, how does all this take place? Well, let's look at the most basic. Romans chapter 16. You'd be surprised how much the Bible talks about mysteries. How many things there are in the Bible that are referred to as being a mystery? <coughs> but you can't understand it unless the Holy Spirit reveals it. And we've all had that experience, haven't we? We've all had the experience where maybe, probably if we went around the room, there's many of you share times, but maybe there were things that you just didn't understand and you couldn't get. I'll say, boom, the Holy Spirit spoke to you. Oh, yeah, I got it. There may have been times when you were frustrated because you were trying to share something that was so simple to somebody and they just oh, couldn't get it. Why? It was a mystery. It has to be revealed by the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 16, verse number 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of what? The mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Verse 26, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets. It's made manifest now, how? By the scriptures. It's made manifest now, how? By the scriptures. It's made manifest now, how? By the scriptures. In other words, God has revealed his kingdom to us in his word, and then we need to have the Holy Spirit teach us his word and give us understanding of his word. You with me so far? Because if we don't grasp this, beloved, we're going to really struggle with a lot of things. You see, the word of God must always be the foundation. There's no exceptions to that. You know, I was listening... Uh, I was just had some free time the last couple, three days at work, and when I knew I was, sometimes I'll get on the computer and go back and listen to different
different sermons or different teachings of people and stuff. And, and, and I went back and I was listening to some things that, that uh, I was familiar with. I was really more denominational background, and I won't say what denomination, because um, I'm a big old bit. As I began to listen to it, I was kind of shocked because I was really surprised how little of God's word they were preaching. And I don't mean that to knock them or anybody, but you know what I heard? I heard some of their top preachers and was considered their best preachers, and all I heard was them talking about their denomination and their denominational position and their denominational stand and how their denomination was the best. You see, beloved, the word of God has to be the foundation. And I don't mean this to be harsh with anybody, but I don't care what any denomination believes. And I don't care what any man believes. If it's not based on the Word of God, it's not right. Period. It has to be the Word. No matter what, the Word of God has to be the foundation. And when you hear that a lot of times, they say, well, you don't know what I believe. No offense. I don't care what you believe. Don't get offended by that. I care what the Word says. Now, if you can say, I believe this because this is what the Word says, then I'm listening to you. But if you're just believing something because it's something you've determined to a conclusion on without the Word of God being the foundation, then it doesn't have merit. And I always share this with the congregation, beloved. I am 100% submitted to the Word of God. You ever hear me get up behind here and teach and preach something that don't line up with the Word of God? You get your Bible and come show me. And I'll absolutely correct myself in a second. But bring your Bible. Not your opinion. There's a difference. I say this to be rough, but I'm just saying this to understand. The foundation of everything as a believer has to be the Word of God. Not tradition, not history, not opinion, not what Grandpa said, not what Grandma said. It has to be the Word of God. Because it can't be understood, the kingdom of God can't be understood by tradition. It can't be understood by your opinion. It can't be understood by my opinion. It can't be understood by my personal experience. It has to be based upon the revelation of God's word. And you hear me talk about all the time about the two houses, don't you? The house is built upon sand is what? Hear the word of God and don't do it. The house built upon the rock is to hear the word of God and do do it. And when the storm comes, the house built upon the rock stands. What's, what is Jesus trying to teach us there? Teach us that the foundation of everything must be the word of God. You know, in Acts chapter 2, and the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, they all began to speak in tongues and prophesy. And what in the world is going on, people ask from here. Peter immediately laid the foundation as this is that which the prophets spoke in Job chapter 2. He immediately laid the foundation of God's word. Jesus, when Jesus went, went in, and people, he was talking with people after his resurrection, Jesus began to tell them, he expounded to them from the scriptures who he was. Now, this, this may sound a little funny to you, but Jesus appealed to the scriptures. Jesus based what he did on the word of God. After he was resurrected, he expounded upon the scriptures all the way back from Moses up to show who he was and what had just had to happen had to take place. Now, would it surprise you if I told you Jesus knows more than the Bible? He does, doesn't he? But what he did, why, why did he do that? Then? Why did he just tell us, well, this is the way it is, and that's the way it is? Why? Because he was, he was demonstrating something to us. He was teaching us that our foundation now has to be the Word of God. He was, he was illustrating that to us. I'm going to show you by the Word of God who I am. Because this is our foundation. So this always, and just like in, in Apostle Paul went into Berea and preached the gospel, what did it say? He says they were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched the scripture daily to see if what Paul said was true. God commended them because they immediately got into the word of God and sought out whether or not it was the truth. Beloved, as believers, our foundation must be the word of God. It can't be anything else. As a, as a pastor, the foundation must be the Word of God. As a church, the foundation must be the Word of God. Any ministry, this must be the foundation. Any home, this must be the foundation. Without exception. Hallelujah. I don't care who you are. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I want to turn there for just a moment. I want to focus on one part of that. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is revelation.
from God. What is in this Bible, you cannot know unless you read it and God reveals it to you. It was in this Bible, you can't know unless you listen to, you know, part of it is listening to somebody like me teach you. That's how we know it. And you can't learn what I'm teaching you unless the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Unless the anointing right now is speaking to you and ministering to your heart, you'll get out of here and forget what I'm saying. But as the Holy Spirit and the anointing teaches us, He reveals it to us. Other than that, it's a mystery. And that's why there's all kinds of people, and I don't know why I'm on this boat today, but there's all kinds of people, beloved, who go to all kinds of colleges and all kinds of seminaries and don't have a clue. Because they're trying to obtain what is a mystery through academic pursuit rather than being taught by the Holy Spirit. And so they're walking out, they've got a bunch of academic facts in their head, and their head's gotten that much bigger, but it's still a mystery. And they'll get up behind pulpits and get academic knowledge to a congregation who will build their heads up and go out and it'll be a mystery. Because it's not Holy Spirit taught. It's not revelation from God. God, Holy Spirit, wrote the Bible. God's Holy Spirit watches over this Bible. God's Holy Spirit called people to preach and teach this Bible. God's Holy Spirit, the anointing is here to teach you. It's revelation from God. Now, this seems really basic and really simple. But we've got to understand this because this is the area where people get into trouble. It's not understanding that some things are a mystery from God and they need to be taught from God rather than figured out with their head. Because when you start trying to figure out the things of God with your head and coming up with explanations with your head, you're getting in trouble with the things of God. If you try to come up with explanations about the things of God with your emotions, then you're getting in trouble with the things of God. It must be the Word. It must come from revelation. Otherwise, you're trying to figure out a mystery with your head. Otherwise, you're trying to figure out a mystery with your emotions. Amen? You with me so far? Psalm 119, verse 18. We're, heading, we're going somewhere today. We're on the train track. Headed for a destination. Psalm 119, verse 18. The psalmist said, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Open thou my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of your word, Lord. Lord, give me revelation. Give me understanding of your word, so that I might walk in your ways. Lord, give me wisdom. Give me understanding of your word, that it might abide in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Lord, give me understanding, Father God, of your word, that it might abide in my heart. So like John 15, 15, 7, I will ask what I will and it shall be done unto me. Lord, give me understanding of your word. Open my eyes to the mystery. This, the, and, and again, after Jesus was resurrected, he was walking and, and sharing himself with some people. And they couldn't, you know, they couldn't get it. They tried to get it out of their head again. And it says he opened their eyes. I think that was Luke 24, 45. Open their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So he not only expounded the scriptures to them, but he opened their understanding that they might understand it. Hallelujah. It didn't come with their brain. It didn't come with their understanding. You see, one of the things that that I challenge people on, I guess, maybe, a lot, not always, but one of the things we have to grasp as believers, beloved, don't try to explain things with your brain. Really, don't try to explain the things of God with your head. Don't try to explain the things of God with your emotion. 
It has to be understanding the revelation of God's word. And as a pastor, you deal with this all the time because you go into a situation and somebody's prayed about a situation and maybe it didn't happen the way they thought. Maybe, you know, some tragedy happened and maybe something else happened. And immediately they begin to think in their heads, why did this happen? If you don't know why it happened from the word of God, then leave it alone. Stop trying to figure it out. If you don't know why it happened from the Word of God, don't try to explain it with your emotions or your human thinking. Hallelujah. I, I'm not going to get home with everybody. Let's say it again, just because I can tell everybody's at everybody's faces. If you don't have understanding of it by the Word of God, then leave it alone. And, and get into God's Word and find out why. But don't go around trying to figure out explanations of why certain things happen in life or don't happen in your life by figuring it out with your brain. Don't go around and try to figure it out by, by your emotions and finding some, some explanation because the natural man doesn't understand the things of God. If you don't have a revelation, then hush. Amen? I mean, and I'll have that in the past. Sometimes people will come to me, and I'm sure it's happened with some of you. They'll lay out some circumstances, some situation. Pastor, why do you think it happened? I don't know. Is what I'll tell you. If I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. Pastor, will you give me an interpretation of this dream? And you'll give me the dream. I said, I don't have a clue. Why? If God doesn't give me revelation, I don't know. If it's something where I have the understanding from God's word and I can sit down and explain it to you with God's word, I'll sit down and explain it to you. But if I don't have an explanation from God's word, then I'm not going to give you my opinion. Hallelujah. Well, if I said, well, that, that, if I say that's good, Pastor, then I've got to stop sharing my opinion about everything. <laughs> but and I'm not saying we don't have opinions about things, but when it comes to the things of God, understand it's a mystery unless we've got revelation from God's Word. And that's what's happened over the years in the body of Christ. Too many people have tried to explain things, why something happened or didn't happen, without having something from God's Word. And we've got all kinds of goofy ideas in the body of Christ now why God does things and don't do things that God has nothing to do with. Why? Because it's a mystery unless we have revelation from God's word. What we know about the kingdom of God is what we have heard of. Remember the parable of the sower? <laughs> the parable of the sower, the sower went out to sow seed. And then we know that, you know, he talks about, you know, some fell on sowing ground and so on and so forth. And Jesus later interprets the parable. And, you know, says, you know, what happened, you know, when the seed sowed and one comes rocking around, the bird comes and swoops and takes it away. And then we go on and goes on and talks about the cares of this world, the afflictions, the persecutions, the lust of other things, and deceitful riches are things that choke the word of God in our life. And then they came to them and asked Jesus, why do you teach in parables? And that's exactly what I'm teaching is what he told them. He says, it's not for them to know. But for you, it is for you to know the things of the kingdom of God. But he makes it very plain there in that parable that when he was teaching that parable, he was teaching that parable to a lot of the people there who were lost and they were saying, what in the world is he talking about farming for? But they had, they had a right to revelation of the Catholic kingdom of God who was not raised. And there's a lot in that parable. I mean, I go to that parable all the time because there's a lot about the revelation of the kingdom of God. If we understand that parable, we're in good shape. You'll understand the things of God a great deal if you understand the parable so the fact that Israel is blind right now is a mystery it refers to it. See, Israel is blind to Jesus right now. That's a mystery. Uh, the rapture of the church is a mystery. Because you can't understand that unless God gives you revelation of that. Ephesians 1, 9 says that God's will is a mystery. What does that mean? That means that the only way you, we can know the will of God is through revelation of his word. That's why I'm saying you leave it alone. Why well, they think if that happened to them because it was God's will? Does the word tell you that? <laughs> then leave it alone. Why well, think this was to happen to me because it was God's will? Does the word tell you that? Then leave it alone. You see, God's will was a mystery. Unless, unless you've got word on it, then leave it alone. And if it's something you say, well, Pastor, I just need to know, then get the word. Find out. 
But leave it alone until you do. I don't know why I just get such a hush when I say that. I'm like, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> you have to leave me thought, y'all don't like me right now, I'm not you. Christ in us, the hope of glory is a mystery. The church, that the church can be partakers of God through the gospel is referred to as a mystery. You can't know anything about it. When you pray in tongues, you pray mysteries, the Bible says. Things can only be known by revelation. <clears throat> See, sometimes when we pray for, in tongues, we're receiving in tongues, we don't know what we're praying, do we? And you know, there, there's a lot of reasons why that could be. It could be that God is having you, using you in prayer for somebody or some situation that if the Holy Spirit showed you, you couldn't handle it in the first place. You fall apart. Mm -hmm. It could be something that you're praying for somebody that's quite honestly none of your business. But God is using you as a prayer vessel. But you're praying a mystery. Something that can only be known if it's revealed by the Spirit of God. Sometimes we have tongues in interpretation. It's a mystery until we have interpretation. It can only be revealed through the Spirit of God. You see, we've got to understand how the kingdom of God functions and how the kingdom of God operates, beloved. You know, and, and, and I just, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to try to cut myself short here, but some of these things just keep cropping up. I mean, just like praying in, in the Spirit, praying in tongues, and that being a mystery. I mean, there's a lot of reasons there that that, that, that would be. I mean, there's a lot of things, and... Keep in mind, there's a lot of spiritual warfare going on. And I'll never forget the time that uh, some of us was with Bible going on and praying for the schools. And, and I just shared just a touch of it, some of you. Um, and, and hardly any human being I ever shared with that. And, and when we were praying in a certain school, and we began to pray, the Lord began to show me stuff in the Spirit. And I'll be honest with you, it was just, I, I got to stop. I mean, it was overwhelming to me. And it was devastating to me. And it really affected me for a while. But it was very difficult for me. And I mean, it was just, it really, I mean, what, what the, the devices and the plans of the enemy was and, and what was going on in the spirit world that we were praying against. And the Lord gave me that flash. He just like, Lord, I mean, it was just, you know, I was almost incapacitated for a few days. I'll be honest with you. And, and I was thinking about that. I was thinking about mysteries and praying in tongues. And I thought, you know, look at how much people are devastated by the horrors of war. And think about if God revealed to us some of the devastation of the spiritual warfare that's going on in this planet. We couldn't handle it. And so a lot of times, maybe that's it. We're praying in mysteries. That's what's taking place. We're praying about situations that we as human beings are too frail to handle, even have an understanding of it. Because there was a time Jesus told his, his followers, he says, you know, there's many things I'm going to do, but you can't have them. You know, some things need to be mysteries. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. I don't know why the Lord comes to my heart. Go to Mark chapter 4 to share that with you. Let it be known that God desires to reveal His word to us. Mark chapter 4. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is Revelation of God, correct? God's word, this is revelation from God, correct? God is given to us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is referred to as a light, isn't it? Thy word is a light unto my feet. Is it how it goes a lamp unto my path? So we know that this is a light. This is a lamp. This is revelation that God gave to us. Now, now let me get the scriptures that I'm about to read you. We're going back to Mark chapter 4. Keep in mind that Mark chapter 4 is the entire chapter is about the Word of God. The, the key thing to that is the seed. And we know the seed is what? The Word. And how the seed, when it's planted in the soil, the things that happen before the seed bears fruit. Now, then we go on to these verses here. And sometimes people want to pull these verses totally out of context and miss the whole point. Mark chapter 4, verse 21. Isn't that what I'm at? And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? Can I ask you a question? Do you really think that God gave us his inspired word so we wouldn't have a revelation of it? Why would God give us his word if he didn't want us to know it? 
Why would God give us his word if he didn't want to understand it? Wouldn't that be goofy for God to give us his word and not want us to know it? And not have a plan that he would reveal his word to us? Not have a plan that he would reveal his truth to us? Wouldn't that be goofy? I mean, surely God wouldn't do that, would he? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret but that it should come abroad. If any man can't hear to hear, let him hear. In other words, you know, if, I, if you came to my house, you knocked on the door, it was in the middle of the night, and, and you said, Pastor, I come in and pray for you. He said, Dad, you come in and you start banging in the stuff everywhere, and, and because it's pitch black, and think, what in the world don't you have a lamp? Oh, yeah, I've got a lamp, but i got it in under bed. You'd think I was goofy, wouldn't you? Well, i got a lamp that's out of the backyard underneath a bush. That would be goofy. So it would be goofy for God to give us his word, his lamp, his light, and then to put it under a bushel where we couldn't understand it. So he gave us this word so that we would have understanding. He gave us this word so we would have revelation of his kingdom and how to live this life, his kingdom life. <coughs> so he said, well, Pastor, why don't I got more understanding then? Why do so many people don't grasp the word? Why is it there, God bless them, there's so many churches who are standing up and preaching all kinds of stuff that maybe don't line up with the Word? <coughs> can, can I give you a, a fresh thought on this? Can I give you some advice? How much understanding we have of God's Word is entirely dependent upon how you respect the Revelation. Let me say that again. How much understanding of God that you have is entirely dependent upon how much you respect God's revelation. How much you treat it as a treasure. Have you ever see all these people, they get all these, I, I watch some shows on TV occasionally, the documentaries, I like a lot of documentaries, well, they'll get that ship and they're getting all this stuff and they're going to go out and they're going to find some sunken ship gather the treasure, they'll invest all kinds of money, years of training, and pursuit to try to find this treasure. And you think about it, that's kind of the human history, isn't it? Mankind has spent his history pursuing treasures of some sort. The greatest treasure on planet Earth, beloved, is right here. The greatest treasure on planet Earth you have sitting in your house. The greatest pleasure on planet Earth you have on your cell phone. The greatest treasure on planet Earth you have on your computer. The greatest treasure you have on planet Earth is right here, a river of life. It's God's Word. And I would ask you this question today. Have you treated this as the greatest treasure on planet Earth throughout your years? Or have you treated it more like a religious artifact? Ooh, look at my Bible that Grandma got me. The amount of revelation we have, beloved, and we'll show Scripture in a moment, is entirely determined by how much respect we have for God's revelation. If we truly grasp the depth of what I've taught today, that God's unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus, he has given to us in his word, so that he's given us his Holy Spirit, so he can reveal those things to us, so we can walk in the fullness of those things. If we truly grasp that, that would be the number one greatest pursuit of our life. We would be more passionate about his word than anybody on this planet is about him. But to many of God's people, it's become a dead history book. Because they've not got revelation from the Spirit. Hallelujah. Okay, guys, it's going to get a lot better here. This <laughs> Sometimes I feel like a surgeon. Sometimes I'm going to put you out. And do some surgery, but you got to remain conscious of this one. I had a dream a couple nights ago. Very similar to a dream I had once before. And this dream is a little bit convicting of all of us. 
in Cluny's name. Um, and, and the dream kind of puzzled me at first because it was one of those dreams I knew when I woke up that it was from God. But I really misunderstood the dream for a day or two. And in this dream, I had had a dream. In the dream, I had a dream. And I knew it was a spiritual dream. And I've got to share this dream with her of life. And, and I went, I, I was gathering everybody up, and I was trying to get everybody to come together. I said, I want to share this dream with you. God's given me this dream, and it, this dream is very important. We've got to hear this dream. And I couldn't get people gathered up. Everybody was just so distracted. And they had to run off here, and run off there, and run off here, and run off there, and run off here, and run off there. I kept trying and trying and trying and trying to get everybody to gather together. I said, the Lord's given me this dream. And finally I got everybody gathered up and then, lo and behold, I got distracted. <clears throat> Just as I got everybody gathered, I started to share my dream. Something happened and I walked away. It started to do something completely different. And then they think, oh Lord, I was going to share the dream with them. so terribly convinced. And the dream was about revelation from God. And the whole point God was telling me throughout the dream, beloved, is, I haven't got the scripture yet, have I? Uh, throughout the dream, is beloved, we've got to respect revelation. We can't allow ourselves to be running off here and running off there and running off here. And I'm not talking about just from the building here. I'm not talking about just from the church here. But I'm talking about the treasure of God's Word. We can't allow ourselves to be distracted from the treasure that it is. And that was the whole dream. As I began to pray, God, what was the dream about? I mean, it was, I was so grieved in my heart. And then, and, and then when I got everybody get up, then I wandered off. I'm like, Lord, what's wrong with me? And I was so grieved in my heart that so easily I was distracted from God's revelation. You think, what does that mean? <laughs> you remember Mary and Martha? You remember how, how, you know, Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha was covered about many things and I'm doing this and doing that and doing this and doing that and went to blame to Jesus. Well, you don't know what my sister doing. She's sitting there doing nothing. I can't get kicked out of it. She's doing nothing but listening to you, Jesus. It's like saying, Pastor, don't you care if those people just sit and listen to your sermon doing nothing else? Well, that's kind of the point. And you to Martha, you, you, you're just worried about too many things. But that which is most needful, she's doing. See, beloved, we've got to really ask ourselves the question, are we Martha's or Mary's? And the Lord just began to speak to me about this. See, we're going to receive as much revelation from God as we're prepared to receive. And no more. <laughs> and we're going to receive an understanding of the things of God when we treat this properly as a treasure that it is. You say, well, Pastor, I ain't got time. I got some advice talking to Jesus about that. Don't say, God, I don't have time for you. You say, what does this have to do? Let's try to find the scripture here. Mark chapter 4, let's try to find what I was going to read. Okay. Explain it to you now, I'm going to read it to you. And without going into a lot of Mark chapter 4, verse 24. Again, keep in mind this is all about the word, all about revelation. I'm just following the scripture where it says, Nothing is hid. And many of them here. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And to you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath to him shall be given. And he that hath not from him shall be taken even now. What's he saying? He's saying basically this. The respect and the measure you give to God's word is the respect and the measure that you will receive. You with me on that? So here's the key point. You're a pastor. Wait a second. You're 
talking about the benefits of fasting. Well, see, one of the things we understand when we're talking about fasting was what? We're trying to get ourselves more spiritually strong and hear better from God. And weaken the things of the flesh and the things of the soul. If we truly respect revelation, we will be quick to fast and pray and get into his word and hear from God. If that's more important than the food on the table, we will not have too big a problem pushing ourselves away from the food. If that's more important than the things that meet our emotional needs, we, we might not have too much trouble pushing away. If proper respect is given to the word of God, then we're willing to sacrifice all the things of this world to open up that Bible and be Holy Spirit taught. If that's the most precious thing in your life, then why would we struggle if we had to listen to and hear from God? Why would we struggle if we had to push away the things of this world to hear from God?
And we're going to put ourselves in place to be Holy Spirit taught the Word of God. And that's a big part of fasting. It's putting yourself in the place and positioning yourself to hear from God. And I see people say, well, I know that's but we're just too busy. You know, I know my answer to that. We're not too busy, we're probably too old. Surgeon was not being put to sleep this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. As I always tell you, though, <laughs> rest assured, you guys got to hear this teaching for hours. I've had to listen to it all before. Every day, God talking to me about this. You know, he didn't leave me out of that dream, did he? No, my dad can run off getting distracted, too. He didn't leave me out right before that. <laughs> It's a mystery if we don't. Amen? Yeah, I need to have a keyboard message all over the place.